you know, Rosario mentioned some of the traditions that he grew up with. He grew up in the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church has a lot of traditions, right? From the, maybe even a robe that a priest will wear, the little hand uh, bucket you wash your hands in with uh, ceremonial, ceremonial washings, the different things, and many different denominations have traditions. Protestants can have traditions that are maybe not healthy. Imagine if I required you all to wear a suit and you have to tithe before you walk in the door or you, know, you have to say three Hail Marys before you walk in the door or our fathers, you know, that, that would be going beyond the commands of God, right? And that's sort of what was happening. And the thing that Jesus is dealing with and Mark records for us is people taking religious traditions and putting it above the commands of God. And there's a big difference between religion and redemption. God works from the inside out. God is after your heart. I want you to imagine, I mean, I have a big cooler here. Imagine if I went fishing. Well, that part's not hard to imagine, me going fishing. But imagine if I went fishing and let, put all this fish in here and, you know, we piled it full of grouper and snapper and along with some frozen squid and shrimp. And then the next... You know, we get back to the dock, we pulled some fish out, there's bloody guts, you know, left some squid in there, and I just, you know, took the hose, hosed the outside of this thing off, and was like, okay, that's good. Next week, come back, go fishing, open up the cooler, and it's like, you know, what would you imagine? It's like maggots, flies, like, okay, there's nothing in there right now, but it's, but just imagine how filthy and smelly and what a disaster it would be inside if we only cleaned the outside of this cooler, right? And it sounds stupid almost, or funny, or cliche, but that's exactly what the religious leaders of the time were doing. That's what Jesus is saying. You are focused only on the external, like a stone veneer on a termite-infested building that's about to crumble. It looks really great, but you need to do something about the inside. And Jesus is calling them out. And that's what one of the illustrations he used was whitewashed tombs. You know, in Israel now, you can find, you can see all kinds of tombs. You can see Absalom's tomb. Beautiful on the outside. David built it for his son Absalom who betrayed him, right? But on the inside, imagine what's going on, you know, 3,000 years after David built this tomb. I mean, it's like, it's, it's a dark, it's dead bones, right? That's all it is. God has something he wants to do in us, and it's so much more than just religious traditions. These, there are some people who, by their just morality, they think that they're going to be accepted by God because they eat a kosher diet, they've never gotten a speeding ticket, they permit their patios, they save all the puppies that they can, you know, it's like, they think they're like, but they got it all together. But it's amazing how those there are some moral, religious, you know, conservative, have all put together on the outside, but they're headed straight for hell because on the inside, they're still unredeemed. There's still a work to be done. God is after our hearts, not just us to honor him with our lips, to have some kind of religious veneer about us. There's a key verse that I want to point out first in Mark 7, a couple of verses this is really the heart of the passage. Mark chapter 7, verse 6. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, uh, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. So they're taking their own ideas about God and they're placing it above the commands of God. They're teaching it as doctrine, the commands of men. They have religious tradition with no heart for God and no submission to God's word. It's never our outward tradition that makes us holy. It's what God does in us. We are holy by faith in our hearts first and obedience is in work coming from the inside out. Right? Let's walk through Mark chapter 7. We're going to cover quite a few verses, so please, 
Make sure you have your Bible. It will be on the screen, but we're going to cover almost 30 verses here, but I want to talk through some of these verses. This is the big idea. So Mark chapter 7, verse 1. So now when the Pharisees gathered to him, to Jesus, with some of their scribes, of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. This is like, we haven't heard about the Pharisees since chapter 2 of Mark. Jesus' ministry is exploding. He is his fame is spreading. He's fed 5,000. He's here healed multiple people. The Pharisees are obviously jealous. They're wanting to stop him. They don't understand why he's gathering such a crowd. And they send sort of a detachment, a, a delegation of Pharisees to try and cause trouble. And Jesus goes head to head with them in conflict, trying to teach them, trying to get their attention. So he sell, he's, they see the disciples washing with hands that were defiled. This isn't a hygiene thing. This is a religious ceremonial thing. And Mark explains it to his Roman audience. Verse 3, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. For there are many other traditions that they observe such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And, he, and, and the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? So there are these ceremonial traditions. The original readers in Rome that Mark's writing to, they didn't understand it either. You and I really don't have much of this going on in our life, but... These religious Pharisees, what they would do, they would take the Torah, the first five books of the Law of Moses, right? And they wanted, they had a good heart essentially, you know, at first, but then they would add on all of these other traditions, these rules, uh, the Talmud, the, uh, this, they would call it the Halakha, it's kind of a funny sounding Hebrew word, but it's the written tradition of the, or all of these sort of, uh, oral traditions and Talmud and all of it put together in one. And they would add to God's word. So these, like, for example, these traditions of ceremonial hand washing is something originally God said for the priests to do. So then they take that and 30 chapters of the uh, halakha, if you will, are addressing ceremonial hand washing. It sounds crazy to us, right? And they would add all of these things for every single worshiper. You wouldn't be able to come into the place of worship without doing all of these different things that they do. You can't be right with God. You can't worship. God's not going to accept you unless you do all of these things that we're saying. Unless you wear this funny hat, unless you wear this robe, unless you do this dance or whatever it is, there's all of these rules. Imagine if we have church elders forced all these things upon you. You're not allowed to come to church unless you first do all of this stuff. They were just off, right? Jesus is going to teach them that it's about the heart. He's always been about the heart. Even the Torah is about the heart, right? They're trying to trap Jesus, but Jesus wants to teach them they need to deal with the wretched and sinful hearts. In verse 6, and he said to them, using Isaiah, Well did Isaiah uh, prophesy of you hypocrites. That's the only time Mark uses the word hypocrites. It's theater, it's a mask. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandments of God, and here's the, here's the issue, right? And hold to the traditions of men. They're putting their own ideas about God above God's word. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, verse 9, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. 
That's a good one for you, you parents with young kids. You could put that on above your dinner table, maybe. You know, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. But you say, verse 11, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corbin, it's a free, I'm familiar, follow me for a minute, with Corbin, that is to, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition. There it is again. Your traditions are over the word of God. And by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. So it's not that just one example, but he uses this example of using religion, a false sense of religion, to avoid what God actually wants them to do. In this case, God is saying you should use your money, and that's in this particular case, back then there was no long-term care, there were no nursing homes, and it's a good thing to help your aging parents. So what they were doing, they were saying, no, this money right here, I'm going to use this for God, and I'm not going to do what God actually wants me to do, even though maybe God wanted me to take care of people. I'm going to say it's God, but not actually do what God really wants me to do. Are you with me? If a son wanted to avoid his responsibility of caring for his parents, he simply needed to declare his money Corbin, dedicated to God. You know, maybe we don't do this in this exact same way, but do we use quote-unquote religion to avoid something that God may command us to do? It could be many different things. In our homes, it could be maybe work. How about do we use religion so that we don't have to work hard? Oh, I can't do that. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be going to church. I mean, I'm going to be, you know, I mean, the Bible is very clear. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially members of his own household, he's denied the faith and worse off than an unbeliever. That's the idea. You're going to say, oh, God told me I don't need to be doing that. But no, God says very plainly, you should be working. If you can. I mean, maybe it's an excuse not to help someone. Someone clearly God has put in your life that you're called to be helping. But you just go on the other side of the road, right? Pass by the other way. What does that remind you of? The Good Samaritan, doesn't it? Good Samaritan. There was a religious person. There was somebody destitute, broken, and struggling in need on the side of the road. He goes to the other side of the road. The Levite. Oh, I'm going to do ministry right now. I can't help this person. It's an excuse. Using God as an excuse not to do the thing that God is saying very clearly in his word to do. Verse 14, And he called people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house, he left the people, and the disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him from within. Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. All of us have dealt with those sorts of issues at some point, but God wants to redeem us from within. But the issue here again is they think that by what they eat, that they are more holy, that, they, that God actually thinks that they are holy because they're not eating bacon. Right? You can eat bacon and go to heaven. I, I want, I'm, I'm so happy to tell you guys this this morning. <laughs> All foods are clean. Just the other night I grilled out. I had three different types of meat on the grill and we had fish 
It was unbelievable. He had pork loins. I had rack of uh, a lamb on the grill. You should try it. And I had, what else was it? Steak, right? <laughs> I'm forgetting steak. <laughs> steak, I mean, it's not about what goes into your body, right? We're not any more holy because we eat a kosher diet, because you eat vegan. Vegan people may act like they're better than you, but they're actually not. <laughs> In God's eyes, we can go to heaven filled with bacon, right? Yeah, (laughs) sooner, exactly. Maybe we shouldn't. I agree. Maybe I'm not as healthy as everybody, you know. Vegans are probably much healthier. And I read this morning it helps save the planet if we eat vegan. I'll just throw that one out there. I don't even know where I'm at in my notes. I mean, but we're, let's see here. Okay. I had four meats for dinner. That's in my notes right here. <clears throat> Listen, God has a plan for all people, right? I mean, we are all on the set le- same level playing field morally from the time we were born, right? And that's what's so interesting about this text. I never realized the context of this next person here, and I want to read a little bit more in just a moment, but God has a desire to save even Gentiles, those who aren't religious. He desires to have a relationship with people, to heal the sick, to mend the broken, to radically change people from the inside out, and the moralists missed it. They think that by their perfect, you know, life, you know, with their, you know, perfectly cut hair and their trimmed lawn and their, you know, everything's put together on the outside. They permit their patios. They have everything, you know, from the world's perspective, it's all together. They don't see their need for a Savior. But we all fall short of the glory of God, right? Pharisees were missing out that their hearts were wretched and wicked Christ is a great physician, and he comes to heal and to save, and that's what we see here. Look at, keep going here in Mark, we're a few more verses. Look at Mark 7, verse 24, and from there he arose away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. This is modern-day Lebanon. This is outside of Israel. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, meaning she was not a religious person. She didn't have the the heritage of a Jewish person. She grew up in a pagan area, a pagan family. She had all kinds of issues in her home. But immediately... She fell down at his feet. Look at verse 25. Immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell down at her feet. Now this woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him. Notice her humility. She knows she's a mess. She begged him to cast out a demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, meaning Israel. Jesus' first ministry was to Israel. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, even the dogs, referring to Gentiles, right, like us, under the table, eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. She has faith in Jesus, right? She believes in Jesus. And she's obedient. The demon has left your daughter, he says. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. She is radically changed by Jesus. The religious Pharisees, thinking they could earn their way to God, they miss it. They miss the redemption. Jesus here is illustrating the true nature of the gospel. It's not religion that saves people who are good. Jesus, through the redemption of the cross, saves people that are wicked. And every one of us, before God, we are wretched, wicked sinners. You know, you think back to the story of Abraham and and Genesis, and God's plan from the beginning was to save people by faith. 
I mean, you think of God had this original plan to save, uh, to ch- he chose a people, right? He, he chooses Abraham. He says, go, and Abraham follows Genesis chapter 12. And Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, look up at the stars and see if you can count them. And he says, so shall your offspring be. And it says, Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness. That was always God's intention, the heart. But the idea is, and the gospel is, is that it's to redeem all the, anyone, the Gentiles, Jews, we're all alike. There's redemption for sinners. And this woman who had a long history of paganism, she understands, the disciples understand. So religion or redemption? Four ideas for us this morning. The first one's going to be longer. Religion or redemption? Number one, if your interaction with God is simply religious tradition, you need redemption. There's a time to open up the cooler, right? (laughs) Let's deal with the stench. Let's deal with the brokenness. You may look really clean and white on the outside, but God wants all of it. He wants to clean us out from the inside out. Open up our hearts to God, right? That's the idea. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God wants to change you. He wants to change your heart as you turn to him. That's what he does. He says, I will give you a new heart. You'll take your heart of stone, hardened by sin, just a distraught, sinful, guilty, wretched heart, and he'll replace it with a redeemed heart, with a soft heart. You know, if you are still just going through some kind of religious motions, you still just come to church, you uh, obey the speed limit the best of your ability, you do everything right, but you've never turned your heart to Jesus, let today be the day, right? Repent of your sins, turn to Jesus as Savior, and receive him. The wages of sin is death. For all have sinned. Notice Romans. It's a very common verse. Right? Verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And then those are my words. Our good works, apart from faith, are useless, meaningless. They accomplish nothing as far as dealing with our guilt, right? Receiving forgiveness. Apart from God, our lives are shattered. This isn't a perfect illustration, but I like this. Think of a shattered glass. Think of this example. I mean, maybe it was a vase, and it's just shattered. Our life was like a vase, and... As soon as we're born, we're just shattered by sin. We have sin in our DNA. It's been handed down to us because of Adam. In Adam, all die, right? We're all just shattered by sin. But there's this idea of kintsugi. It's an ancient uh, art form. If a precious vase or something is broken and shattered, uh, what they will do, they'll actually uh, take this, these broken pieces and they'll put it back together using precious metals like gold or platinum or silver. And this vessel becomes far more valuable and better than it ever was, right? And that's the idea. Here's a picture of this, some kind of vase put together with pure gold. And that's, in some ways, what God does for us. We can't fix ourselves, right? Sin has shattered us. We need Jesus. Jesus is the potter. We're the clay. And he puts us back together. We're saved by grace. That's what... uh, Ephesians says you're saved by grace through faith and then right in verse verse 10 of Ephesians 2 says you're his workmanship God is a craftsman right and he takes our lives and from the inside out dealing with our hearts he begins to work with us it's not you that can put your life together it's not you that can earn your way to heaven it's Jesus it's redemption it's from the heart the Syrophoenician woman knew she needed a savior I pray if if you still think you're good enough, let today be the day that you understand and that your eyes are opened. The second idea this morning is 
pretty basic ideas, but some traditions are healthy if they come from a redeemed heart. But traditions are not God's word, right? You come in, you walk into most Calvary chapels, it's a person with more white hair than me and a Hawaiian shirt. You're never going to find me in a Hawaiian shirt. I mean, I don't think I own one of them, right? That's a tradition. I don't know why it's, maybe it's because most Calvary chapels are surfers. You know, Dave's wearing a Hawaiian shirt. He's very Calvary chapel, right? Our last church, I used to joke, you know, the old church, I used to joke, we don't have the freedom to wear a tie at this church. Because if you wear a tie, you come in and everybody knows you're a visitor, you know. That's just traditions, right? We have a tradition of gathering. We have a tradition of singing, using an acoustic guitar. That's not God's word. That's a tradition. We gather. The command is to gather, right? Don't neglect meeting together. But if we do it at a different time, maybe do it at 9 o'clock. If we had our own building, I think we could have a Saturday night service. Make Saturday nights our service. But that's the tradition we can't set tradition over God's command, right? We have all kinds of traditions. You know, a third idea this morning, outward obedience is the right response to the inner work of redemption. There's two really th- thoughts here. One is you're never, if you, you're like, if you find yourself thinking, well, I went to church on Sunday, Monday better, better be like a good day, Right? That's not the gospel. That's not how it works. That's the opposite of the gospel. God blesses you by grace. You're not going to earn his sort of blessing on your life based on traditions you keep. But the other idea is, listen, obedience happens from the inside out. We do begin to obey. You know, you think of for example, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands, right? Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. We are called to obey, but not in a religious way, thinking that we somehow deserve for achieving for ourselves heaven but when god gets a hold of your your heart we do begin to obey the lord and the things that he calls us we love him we love those around us faith without works is dead and fourthly this morning you know god desires that we cultivate pure hearts through the redeeming work of the holy spirit you know, I know that I'm not alone in that my own heart can begin to wander. I know I'm not alone in that. Like, I can become sort of, let's say I'm like a house, and all of a sudden there's a termite. There's a termite of worldliness, and I find myself, why am I thinking so much about fishing? Or why am I thinking so much about just worldly things? I know I'm not alone in that, right? Right? Why am, I in the, why am I in the flesh, right? Why am I angry? Why am I coveting? Why am I envious or whatever? There's some things that I can do, and I've done in the past, to cultivate a heart for God. I know I can begin to flip through social media too much. I remember during COVID, Dave and I and several others I think it, it stretched out to almost two years. We prayed together every morning at 6.15, every day. We were so, we were just pressing into the Lord. And we put together, this came from that time, we put the, I put this together, uh, this sort of thing called Reboot. And it's 40 days, and I'm going to do this in, starting August 14th. And it's just 40 days of cutting out social media. For me, I'm adding on there praying every day, 615, with someone. I'm going to cut out, and I'm going to add, you can read through this later. It's pretty radical. You don't, I'm not asking you all to do it. But maybe if your heart, maybe if your house is filled with termites, if it was your physical house, you'd call the pest control company, wouldn't you? You'd have that thing tinted. You know, for me, I'm going to get back. I'm going to cut out. Uh, for me, I, it's not a big deal, movies, I don't really watch many movies, but it's cutting out movies, TV, social media, 
I'm going to read 30 minutes a day, read the Bible 30 minutes a day, a book 30 minutes a day. And you can look at the brochure yourself if you want to. Maybe for you it's just, hey, you're going to cut out social media for 40 days. It's just a tradition. It's, for me, that's pest control, you know, <laughs> cultivating a heart for God. Because sometimes, I tell you what, I feel like my heart is straying a little bit, right? We don't want to stray away from the Lord, and we don't want our hearts to be far from me. God help us. Would he say that? Your heart is far from me? Would he say that to you? Your heart is far from me. It's a challenging, challenging statement. Cultivate a relationship with God. God sees everything going on inside, right? You don't have to hide it. Nothing you're hiding from him. But hey, the band's going to come. We're going to partake in communion this morning. Ushers, if you would, pass out the elements. Just take, take a minute. Go, go. As you receive the elements, uh, don't actually take the elements yet. If you could, please wait. You don't have to take an element. If, you don't, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you don't have to take but uh, if you would, just take the chalice and open up the bo- bottom first. Take the bread out, take the cup, and just hold on to it for just a minute. Let's take just a few minutes as they sing, and we're almost done, but as they sing a couple of verses of this song, examine your hearts. That's what the Bible says. Don't take communion in an unworthy manner, meaning don't take it arrogantly. In your hearts, like the Syrophoenician woman, fall at the feet of Jesus in your heart, confessing your need. Maybe in your mind, in your heart, just pray for a minute. Tell God you know you're a wretched sinner in need of grace. Right? As they sing, just take a minute and pray to yourself as we sing. Continue to pray. Sing that second verse. By your perfect sacrifice, I've been brought in. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning. We thank you that even though we are wretched sinners, Lord, we've sinned against you many times, Lord, in many ways. But you've redeemed our hearts by faith. You've given us a new heart, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. 
We know it's all because of grace. It's not anything we've done, Lord. It's all grace, Lord. We thank you for your amazing grace in our lives, Lord. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all share in the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's all share in the cup together. Praise the Lord. Hey, if you need prayer for any reason, I'll be available. The elders are available. But uh, let's all stand together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.